Hi, we're going to uh, go ahead and get started with our second part of the class. Uh, a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, I just want to make sure that uh, everyone is aware of. Uh, on uh, January the 23rd, we will have a quiz on uh, Chapter 20, uh, the lecture material from tonight. Uh, there's an additional reading out there that uh, you're responsible for. Uh, there's chapter 21 lecture definitions due, which allows you to get two points extra credit on quiz one. There's also definitions due from chapter 21 at the start of the class. Uh, there's an additional reading uh, out there as well. You'll have, uh, and you'll be responsible for chapter 22 notes file. Uh, and I uh, want to talk a little bit about uh, next week on the 23rd, what an at-will employee is. Um, so um, that's kind of just kind of going forward and uh, where we're at in the class. Um, let's pick up with uh, negotiable instruments. Uh, what happens if the endorsee uh, uh, or payee or endorsee misspells their name? Uh, and believe it or not, this happens quite often. Uh, if the payee or an endorsee does misspell their name or um, it's um, you know, transposed letters or whatever, bottom line, it's misspelled, uh, the payee or endorsee can endorse the instrument in the misspelled or wrong name, the correct name, or both. So uh, the, the Article 3 of the UCC uh, states that um, the payee or endorsee, if they misspell their name, they can endorse uh, the negotiable instrument in that misspell misspelled name, uh, the correct name, or they could uh, endorse it in both names. So uh, that's interesting, but uh, that is, that is uh, 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 falls under revised Article 3 of the UCC. Now, what happens if you have multiple payees or endorsees? Well, simply what would happen is you would have, excuse me, you would have a payable jointly. Uh, you would just uh, simply write the words and. So um, if, it, if it's payable to two or more people, you would just write and between their names. Uh, and um, both of those, uh, those individuals would have to endorse the the negotiable instrument uh, if it's payable to both the individuals. For instance, um, uh, tax return checks. Maybe um, the tax return check would say Mr. James and Margaret Johnson. Well, both endorses then would both uh, would both individuals would have to endorse that negotiable instrument uh, for that for that uh, negotiable instrument to be uh, valid. Uh, and it also, you could have or you could have the ghost instrument uh, paid to the order of Stephen or Juanita Hughes. Uh, in this particular case, then uh, either person's endorsement or signature would be uh, allowed and would be uh, acceptable uh, in, in this particular case. So let's turn now, excuse me, let's turn now to... Uh, page 415 uh, in your book under uh, international law negotiable instruments uh, payable in foreign currency uh, and that again is on page uh, 415 so um, example an instrument payable in uh, 1 million won KPW in South Korean currency is a negotiable instrument that is governed by Article 3 of the UCC. Unless the instrument states otherwise, an instrument that is payable in foreign currency can be satisfied by the equivalent in U.S. dollars as determined on the due date. The conversion rate is the current bank offered spot rate at the place of payment on the due date. The instrument can be expressly provided that it is payable only in the stated foreign currency in that case, the instrument cannot be paid in U.S. dollars. So it can be stated, negotiable instrument can be paid, or you can state a negotiable instrument that will be paid in the, the currency uh, of, the, of the current negotiable instrument. So uh, <clears throat> for next week, 
Uh, obviously, if you've watched uh, these videos, then you will get um, uh, five points uh, extra credit uh, on the quiz. And uh, you simply need to turn these in with your quiz next week. So um, I want to know uh, what are the types of negotiable instruments. Uh, remember we talked about those. Write the, uh, the type down and the definition of each of those. Uh, I also want to know about the requirements for creating a negotiable instrument. So one of those you remember it must be in writing and another one it must be payable to the order or to the bearer. And if you'll just fill those in, there's, there's actually seven of those. So if you'll fill those in. Um, also, if, uh, if you will uh, um, discuss payable on demand or at a definite time. So a negotiable instrument must be payable either on demand or uh, at a definitive time in the future. So if a negotiable instrument is paid on demand, what is this? What is payable on demand? And then what is uh, uh, payable at a, a definitive time? Okay. Um, we talked about tonight, and also if you'll uh, turn this in as well with your quiz, what is a prepayment clause, a acceleration clause, and an extension clause? Uh, those three definitions of those uh, particular uh, uh, clauses in a negotiable instrument uh, do not affect its uh, negotiability. However, I want to know what those are. So again, prepayment clause, acceleration clause, and extension clause. What is a uh, non-negotiable contract? If you will uh, write out the definition to a non-negotiable contract. Uh, and um, if you will list only, just list only, I do not need a definition, what the types of endorsements are. If you remember, uh, there's uh, more than three of those. So to give you a hint, um, if uh, you will, uh, if you will um, uh, jot those down and turn it in. Also, what happens if uh, a payee or endorsee misspells their name? Uh, is it valid? Uh, can they um, uh, endorse with that misspelled name? Do they need to endorse with their correctly spelled name? And, and if you could just uh, uh, explain that a little bit in detail. And then what happens if you have a multiple payees or endorsees? Um, how would you uh, how would you handle that? Um, I think that's uh, that's uh, uh, um, uh, something I would like for you to turn in as well. So again, for uh, five points extra credit on the quiz uh, next week, which is uh, will be will be meeting on the twenty third. The quiz again will be on this uh, lecture material, chapter twenty. What are the uh, types of negotiable instruments and the definitions? What's the requirements for creating a negotiable instrument? Um, what's payable on demand or at the end of time? What's the, uh, what was a prepayment, acceleration, and extension clauses? What is a non-negotiable contract? What were the types of endorsements? I don't need the definitions, just what the types were. Uh, what happens when you have misspelled or wrong name? And finally, uh, if you have multiple payees or endorsees, uh, how do you handle those particular situations. So if you will uh, if you will uh, turn those in, you'll get five points extra credit. So uh, a couple of other housekeeping notes. Uh, I've already had a few emails on the presentation at the uh, end of the semester. So again, for some of you, this may be a little bit redundant, but uh, I think it's it's uh, again uh, good to uh, good to know and good to talk about it because it is worth 10% of your grade. Um, if you turn to page eight on your syllabus, uh, there's uh, essentially six topics there that I have approved uh, for uh, presentation. Uh, if you want to provide a, uh, if you want to do a presentation on another topic, by all means you can. Just just make sure that we talk about it 
uh, and you get my approval before you do that. And, and I've never not approved one, but just kind of keep me in the loop with that. With that, but there's six topics at the page of eight at page eight that that most students uh, um, go ahead and and give their presentation on. So uh, the next couple items is really what I was having the emails on, but. The presentation must cover the following items below. Uh, you got to introduce the topic, uh, why you've chosen the topic, a brief history of the topic, how it relates to business law, some interesting facts that will help other students, and then finally a conclusion. If you get those uh, six points in your presentation, then you're well on your way to uh, uh, making a really good grade on the presentation. A couple of other uh, items that sometimes people get points taken off for is you've got to have some sort of handout for the class. Uh, it could be a newspaper, newspaper article, it could be uh, an internet article, uh, it could be a, a selection from the book where you've actually taken uh, a section out of our book and copied that. You can have maybe an outline of your presentation. But you should always, when given a presentation, you should always have some sort of handout for your group. Uh, you should have some sort of visual aid. Uh, most students um, develop a PowerPoint presentation and we will have a, a, a laptop computer and in the room we're in, uh, we do have um, capability, a LCD player and, and uh, presentation capability. So, but most students use a visual aid in the form of a PowerPoint presentation. You can, if you're not familiar with PowerPoint, then again, I'm not going to penalize you for that. You can get some of what's called butcher paper, or this large white paper, uh, and you can post uh, articles or uh, you could post, I've seen students uh, post an outline of their presentation on that, uh, and there's many different things you can do with that. Uh, and I've even, I had one student that actually wrote uh, the presentation as far as the outline of the presentation on the uh, whiteboard and refer to that during the presentation. That's all those are fine. PowerPoint, large white paper, butcher paper, butcher block, but it's like a, a trifold or the blackboard um, with your outline is, is, uh, is also appropriate. So the length of presentation, it says in the syllabus uh, five to ten minutes. Uh, it's probably going to be about five minutes. Um, and, and it'll depend on the class size, but generally about five minutes because I like to uh, like to give feedback uh, to everyone as a as a group at the end of the presentation. And and really, you're expected to uh, practice your presentation uh, prior to uh, prior to giving the presentation. A lot of students go over, and uh, and uh, you know most of the time I have to stop you, and um, it just kind of uh, really throws people off when I have to do it, when I have to do that. So it's probably going to be five minutes, and uh, just just keep it to five minutes, and and you'll be fine. So here's an example of what one student did. Uh, if you're in class last week, you saw this. But uh, for their handout, uh, they basically made a copy of their PowerPoint presentation, and uh, it's a real good presentation. It was about the flag. Uh, and they basically copied every one of their PowerPoint slides and gave each student one of the slides. Also, uh, a student uh, gave a handout um, that accompanied their uh, presentation, and it talked about this, this particular presentation was on the American flag, and he gave out a pamphlet on the American flag, and I think he picked this up at Cracker Barrel, but great, great uh, handout to give to your, to your class or to your uh, group that you're presenting to. And also, um, you, uh, here, here's an example of another one, uh, seven steps to a uh, business plan. And uh, this student basically typed this up based on their, their information that they got uh, from their uh, research and uh, handed that out to the class. So. Again, on, on the presentation, uh, some of the key items uh, from, from last semester, and I just want to pass these on to you. And again, uh, this is 10% of your grade. So I, I really um, stress the presentation uh, because it can be a difference between an A and a B, especially if you're right on the edge. And, and a lot of students, uh, they don't even show up for it. They, they totally... Uh, for better choice of words, blow it off and, and don't come to the presentation because they're intimidated. Don't be intimidated. Please come. 
try your best. I'm not going to take off points. Uh, you know, this is not a presentation class, so to speak. But as I said the first night, uh, I think one of your successes or, or potential success factors is if you can present well and speak well in front of a group. Um, and that's the reason why we're doing this. I think giving a presentation, whether you've got to put together a business plan and submit it to the bank and go have a bank meeting, or if you're talking to a group of investors who may invest in your business, whatever you decide to do, at some point in your career, you're going to have to present. And what better place than, than this forum here at ACC in this class to do that? So some of the, the, the key takeaways from, uh, from last uh, class presentations was make sure you use good eye contact. And when I say good eye contact, you're not staring or looking at just one person. You're looking at everyone in the room, and typically where I sit, I usually sit in the back of the room with the uh, with the, your fellow students. You know, don't look at me. Uh, you know, glance at me, but treat me just like any other a person that's in your group or in your audience. Uh, look at each individual or each person in the audience. Have confidence. Uh, do the research. Uh, you've got an outline of, of what you need to do. A practice and you'll be perfectly fine so so have confidence don't be nervous uh, if you're going to use a PowerPoint presentation please 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 don't run uh, lines together and example of that would be if this student wanted to do a presentation based on the seven steps to a business plan uh, you would not want to put this whole entire par paragraph on a PowerPoint slide you want to break that up into maybe uh, a few bullet points. You want to use that white space. You want to look professional. If you uh, uh, run all those sentences together, it's very, very distracting. So uh, try not to do that. Uh, work on your presentation skills. Practice. One of the best things to do is practice in front of a mirror. Uh, I've done that before. There's nothing wrong with that. Or practice in front of your significant other uh, and get their feedback. Uh, speak aloud enough for others to hear you. Uh, as I said the first night, uh, I have a difficult time hearing, and uh, uh, I'm sure others, if you if you talk very soft, uh, make sure others in the room can hear you. Uh, avoid reading from the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, if you kind of see how I give a presentation, you know I don't know uh, everything uh, about this course material. I know some. Uh, but you see me referring back to notes, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, as long as you just don't read verbatim uh, from your notes, you'll fi you're fine. Uh, always have a handout. You should uh, again. I know I'm I'm beating it up, but I always try to hand out, have a handout. Have some sort of visual aid, like a PowerPoint presentation, easel paper. You know, gosh, uh, write it. Uh, write your outline of your presentation, your different topics, and what you're going to speak about and present on the board if you have to prior to your presentation. Uh, make sure your audience can see your PowerPoint presentation. Um, I've had some great PowerPoint presentations in the past, but the the, the font was really um, uh, small, and you couldn't see it from the back of the room. Look over your pres presentation and practice, practice, practice. Uh, I can't stress that enough, so uh, you'll be fine with that. But but don't come up, go through the entire course, and blow off the presentation because it is 10% of your grade, and uh, you know use it as a a forum to uh, to really in, improve your presentation skills. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, presentations uh, uh, there. So again. Uh, check Moodle at least uh, at a minimum twice per week, uh, preferably uh, every day. Just glance over it. Uh, sometimes I'll post uh, uh, some announcements on there uh, or um, uh, some other uh, tidbit of information that you may have. Uh, again, if you were not at uh, last week's class and this is your um, uh, this week would have been your first week actually in class. Uh, and if you've not given me your contact information, uh, please do so. And, and basically what I'm wanting is uh, your first name, last name, and a phone number that you check that I can text or call and get a hold of you and let you know if class has been canceled or 
if we're having to, to move class or uh, sometimes we're having to do uh, uh, classes like this where you have to log into Moodle and, and download, the, uh, download the lecture um, electronically. So hopefully we have uh, covered uh, the uh, chapter in depth. Uh, again, um, I try to hit the highlights of the chapter. Uh, it's up to you to, to really read the chapter and understand it more in depth. Uh, again, our learning objective, objectives distinguish between negotiable and non-negotiable instruments. I think we did that. I gave you a, up front, I gave you a uh, example of uh, the difference between negotiable and non-negotiable instruments. Describe drafts and checks, identify the parties to these instruments. Remember, we, we talked about that, the bearer, the payee, um, the endorsee, uh, we talked about that. Describe promissory notes and certificates of deposits and identify the parties of those instruments. Uh, we talked about that, and I think we, uh, we, covered, uh, we covered that uh, but pretty good. Uh, just back to the check, just remember, just get a, some, you know, if I tell you this because it's going to be on the quiz, it's going to be on the test, it's easy points, but just get a check. Uh, the, the bank uh, that it, the check's from, the pay-to bank, is the drawee who owns the money, also called the acceptor of the draft. The payee is actually the person you're paying the check to, and the drawer is the issuing party. So and typically, that's that's you if that's writing the check. Um, let's see. Promissory notes again. We uh, we talked about uh, a promissory note is a two-party negotiable instrument. Uh, it's an unconditional promise by one party to pay another party. Um, it usually occurs when one party borrows money from another party. There's there's two types of notes again. There's a time note and a uh, demand note. Uh, and in a little bit on security, make sure you remember what security is or collateral. Uh, it's basically what you're putting up as uh, uh, if I don't pay back my loan, then uh, Mr. Or Mr. Mr. or Mrs. Bank, this is what you can have. In, in, in other words. Uh, this is what I'm putting up as collateral. Um, distinguish between blank, special, qualified, and restrictive endorsements. I think we talked about that. I think I even have you doing some extra credit on the, uh, the, the uh, at, uh, middle of the presentation. I asked you to do that, and um, I definitely will get some, uh, some extra credit from that. Uh, again, distinguish between blank, special, qualified, and um, Restrictive endorsements, if I can find that. Yep. Uh, again, a blank endorsement does not specify a particular endorsee. This endorsement creates uh, a, a, a bearer paper. So if it doesn't specify a particular endorsee, a specific endorsee, then that's, um, uh, it's a blank endorsement and uh, it creates a bearer paper. In other words, pay to the order of cash, uh, potentially. Uh, you have a special endorsement. It basically, this specifies uh, the person to whom the endorsee intends the instrument to be payable to. Uh, and the endorsement creates, uh, this endorsement also creates order paper. Uh, you have um, an unqualified, which does not disclaim or limit liability. Uh, the endorsee is liable on the instrument if it is not paid by the maker, acceptor, or drawer. Basically, you're on the hook for it. Um, uh, and uh, again, uh, uh, restrictive endorsement is conditions. Uh, there are four types of restrictive endorsements. I'm not sure if we covered this or not. I apologize, but glad we're kind of going back and summarizing this. Uh, there's a conditional endorsement, endorsement prohibiting further endorsement. Endorsement for deposit or collection and endorsement and trust. So uh, make sure you hit all those. So, hey, this is uh, chapter 20. Good chapter. Uh, make sure you read the chapter. Make sure you uh, look at the notes. The PowerPoint is on Moodle. Uh, chapter 21 uh, notes uh, are on Moodle as well. Make sure you come prepared to... Uh, to uh, 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 discuss chapter 21 next week. We'll actually have a quiz and then we will uh, get into chapter 21. So, 
I know this may have been a little bit unusual tonight. Uh, it didn't give you an opportunity to ask questions, but if you do have any questions, please feel free to uh, text me, call me, or email me. Again, my number is 336-214-2207. Uh, I do travel quite a bit, so uh, texting me is the best way to get a hold of me. Uh, again, if you send me any emails, send it uh, obviously to the first one as shughes18 at triad.rr.com. It's on the syllabus. And also send it to my, uh, to my email that's uh, at uh, Alamance Community College as well. So hopefully uh, this was uh, um, uh, beneficial to you. And again, I apologize for not uh, being uh, our second um, night that we've met, not being able to be there. But uh, uh, again, as I said, uh, on the first night I do travel, things come up. And uh, unfortunately, this week uh, I, uh, I have to be away. So we'll be there next week. Uh, and um, uh, hopefully you have a good week. Study uh, Chapter 20. And um, we'll talk to you later. Take care.